Hey, welcome to the second episode of Marx and Chill. Today we're going to cover Prophet of Capital, which is the second manuscript of the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844. And if you have no idea what's going on, maybe you missed the first episode of this series, make sure to check out Marx and Chill 1. I'm going to put the link somewhere along this video so you're all caught up and we're on the same page. First, Marx discusses capital. He asks, what is the justification of capital in other man's labor? How can we justify involving money or funds into someone else's labor? And how does one acquire supply? How does one become the owner of products created? And how these things happen is basically by virtue of law. He asks, what does one acquire with money inherited? According to Adam Smith from Wealth of Nations, the person who inherits a great fortune does not necessarily inherit political power. However, what the inheritance gives them is the power of purchasing, command over all the labor and the product of labor which then they can use in the economy. Therefore, capital is the governing power over labor and its products. The capitalist possesses this power not based on their personal qualities, but based on the fact that they're able to accumulate wealth. Their power is the purchasing power of their capital, which nothing can withstand. Later in this piece, we will see how the capitalist exercises their governing power over labor and then the governing power of capital over the capitalists themselves. First of all, what is capital? According to Adam Smith's writing, capital is stored up labor. Funds or stock is the accumulation of products. Stock is called capital when it yields its owner a revenue or a profit. So moving forward, feel free to replace the word capital or stock with funds, money, anything that helps you make sense of this writing. Secondly, let's talk about the profit of capital. The profit or gain of capital is different from wages of labor in two ways. First, the profit of capital are regulated by the value of the capital employed. Although in big operations, the salary of a worker has no relation to the amount of capital which he oversees. And the labor of the owner is reduced to almost nothing, yet, they still demand profits in proportion to their capital. The capitalists will have no interest in employing workers unless they get back more than what it costs to employ them. And similarly, the capitalists will have no interest in advancing funds unless they will get more in return. The capitalist thus makes profit on two things, on the wages and on the raw material that he advanced. How much profit does capital earn? It's even more difficult to calculate profit of capital than wages due to the outside variables. For example, the product's price might fluctuate or there could even be an accident during transit or even mistakes in the warehouse that would result in losses for the owner. However, based on the interest on money, British merchants, for example, believe that double interest is considered a reasonable profit. Now, the lowest rate of profit must be enough to compensate for all the accidental losses. And the highest rate of profit can cover entire rent of the land and reduces the wages of labor to the lowest rate. Now, besides competition, here are some of the ways in which the capitalist uses to keep the market price above the natural price, meaning ways in which they can make even more profit. One way is secrets in trade. If, for example, the market is far away from those who supply it, he can keep the higher prices secret. This also stops other capitalists from flooding into that particular industry. Another is secrets in manufacture, which allow the capitalists to reduce cost of production and supply its products at even lower prices. In places where the location is non-negotiable, for example, wine has to happen in a certain region of the nation, then the capitalist creates monopolies. Their monopolies prices are the highest possible. Capitalists can also raise profits by acquiring new territories or branches of the business, reduce competition, and then rise prices. And through every step of the manufacturing process, the rises always continue to increase because the money to employ people is going to be greater every step along the way, meaning it's going to cost a lot more for somebody to make fabric that is going to cost somebody to create thread. So therefore, you must be able to pay that increase in wage and still have profit. Thus, human labor increases the profits of raw materials when they convert them into manufactured goods, but not the wages of labor. Now, let's look at the rule of capital over labor and the motives of the capitalist. Personal profit is the only consideration and motive for determining which industry a capitalist chooses to do business, not the type of labor it will create nor adding any value to society. The most useful way to invest his capital is that which creates the biggest profits, not that which provides useful employment nor better use of nature. Profit is the goal 
of all and any plans presented by the capitalist. But the rate of profit doesn't rise with prosperity and fall with the decline of society, like rent does. On the contrary, profits are low in rich countries and high in poor countries. Profit is always highest in nations going to ruin. Therefore, the interest of the capitalist class is not the same as the general public. Their only interest is to decrease the seller's competition and to deceive and to oppress the public. Now, let's discuss the accumulation of capital and competition among capitalists. According to Adam Smith, the increase of stock, which raises wages, tends to lower the capitalist's profit because of the competition among the capitalists. For example, if there are two grocery stores in one town, the competition among them will tend to make them both lower their prices so they can compete for more and more business than if there was only one store. Now, for the society, this competition among capitalists is the only defense, since it raises wages and it lowers the price of goods. But this competition is only possible if money is held in many hands. However, capital only comes into being through accumulation. And the competition facilitates the accumulation of capital. So inevitably, through this competition, capital ends in the hands of the few. Meaning, capitalism does away with the actual only defense the society has against it. We've been told that the profit on capital is in proportion to the size of the capital. And therefore, we can assume that large capital accumulates profits much more quickly than smaller investments. But because of competition, an increase in capital actually decreases the profits. The first to suffer is the smallest capitalist, meaning the more businesses there are, the less profit there is because there's more competition and the rival capitalists race to the bottom to outcompete for people's businesses. Naturally, the smaller capitalists lose first, so it's not necessarily true that the profit on capital is proportional to the size of the capital. Most big capital will return a profit, and small capital will tend to lose. So this actually shows what's at the heart of capitalism. The ratio of capital to revenue regulates that of industry and inactivity. According to Adam Smith, wherever capital has a strong presence, industry exists, and wherever revenue dominates, inactivity exists. Now let's discuss employment of capital in this condition of increased competition. As money increases, the quantity of money to be borrowed at interest also grows. However, when the amount of money to be borrowed increases, the interest diminishes, simply because this is a condition of the market. The price of things lowers when there's more of it. And because there's an increase of capital, little by little it becomes more difficult within one nation to find a profitable method of employment of any new capital. As a consequence, arises another form of competition between the capitalists, which is labor. Not only must the capital sell his products at a lower cost, but they must pay more for their labor, because the competition among capitalists raises wages while it lowers the price of the profit on the products. The smaller capitalist has the choice to either use up all his capital when he can no longer live on interest because the amount of interest is going down, or set up a business themselves to sell their product at a lower price, pay higher wages, and thus ruin themselves. And if the bigger capitalist wants to ruin the smaller one, they can. They can even suffer temporary losses until the smaller capitalist is ruined. Furthermore, the bigger capitalist is always buying at a cheaper rate because he can buy a larger quantity, which is how he can afford to sell cheaper products. However, the capitalist that became a business owner will also contribute to the lowering of interest in society. So naturally, the capitalist must produce more and more to attempt to increase their profits, crushing the small capitalist completely. And the result, of course, of this competition of large and small capitalists is a deterioration of products, fake production, and universal poisoning. Now, another important thing in the competition of large and small capitalists is fixed capital versus circulating capital. Circulating capital is money employed in manufacturing or purchasing goods and selling them again. Circulating capital results in no profits while it's in the capitalist's possession or it stays in the same shape it must transform in order to yield a profit. For example, for me, paint is circulating capital. It was worth something, but it won't be worth more unless I make it something else entirely and I sell it for a profit. Fixed capital, on the other hand, is money invested in the improvement of land or purchase of instruments or machinery. The less money you spend on fixed capital, 
the higher the profits since you can spend the rest of the money on circulating capital so for me a paintbrush is fixed capital i'm not really gonna make profit on this but it's gonna enable me to make something that will make me profit <laughs> now of course this relation benefits the big capitalists for example the fixed capital needed for an office it's gonna be around the same amount of money so of course the smaller capitalist is gonna feel that a lot more it's gonna feel a lot more expensive than for the person that has more money on top of that the bigger capitalists will have more credits and access to borrowing money so they don't need to have the money in hand unlike the small capitalist and in the advanced nations where almost all labor has become factory labor the smaller capitalist usually doesn't even have enough money to create the necessary fixed capital now in nations in which many people are allowed to own the land the population is driven into trades to find work but a nation that divides the land through debt, that debt usually brings people into the needy and discontent. And in that second nation where we're dividing the land through debt, big properties tend to swallow small properties and the workers who are now not required for the cultivation of soil are driven into industry. Now products of the same kind change based on changes in the method of production, especially due to the use of machines. For example, due to the introduction of machinery, the price of cotton goods decreased both within the nation of England and abroad. And while the needed workers have decreased, the amount of con workers has actually increased because the demand of con goods is now so high. But of course, the growing competition among businesses have brought the price of con goods even lower and the profits have diminished. Therefore, some areas of industry will always prefer overproduction as an attempt to increase their profits. But what this really does is create bankruptcies and instability among the capitalists, throwing some of them to a proletariat when their business fail. And of course, as always, it's the working class that suffers the most through such failures because there's some more unemployed workers competing for the same jobs. Now, according to Pecker, to hire out one's labor is to begin one's enslavement while using materials of labor is to establish one's freedom, since there is nothing human in materials. However, materials without labor are incapable of creating wealth. Human law has given owners the right to use and abuse the materials of labor. They have no obligation to provide work to the people without homes, nor to provide adequate wages. They have complete freedom to run their businesses as they like without consenting anything but their own interest as an individual. Now this right to use and abuse all instruments of production and this arbitrary competition among capitalists results in the following. Everyone produces whatever they want, how, when, and where they want to. They produce well or badly, too much or too little, too soon or too late, all the while ignoring the needs, resources, demand, or supply of society. They sell whenever they want to, to whomever they want, at the price that they want, based entirely on chance. Basically, it becomes another scenario of only the fittest can survive. While one area in society might be experiencing a scarcity, another area could be experiencing waste. While one seller can sell for a high price, another might be experiencing great losses. The capitalist uses their own judgment to produce what's in style. However, by the time you produce the good, it might not even be fashionable anymore, so you experience a loss, which is why bankruptcies occur constantly creating instability and decreases of wages and profits and all this waste of effort and wealth happening in the arena of fierce competition. Now Marx quotes Ricardo's book on the principle of political economy and taxation, rent of land. Nations are nothing more than production shops. Man is a machine for consuming and producing. Human life is a kind of capital and men are nothing. The product is everything. Provided that the income remains the same, it doesn't matter to a nation how many workers exist. Quoting Buret, he says, The master who buys people's labor is not responsible for providing adequate wages or lowering their duration of labor. Quotes Adam Smith when he says, Many people of Great Britain don't have the capital sufficient to cultivate their lands, nor the money to carry over the raw materials to the place where there is demand for them. And if you do encounter some merchant, there's a high likelihood that he's usually representing another wealthier merchant from another city. Now, the annual production of the land and labor can only be increased by increasing the number of workers or by increasing their own productive power. You must accumulate funds before you divide the labor. And since you have more workers, you now need an even bigger amount of raw materials. And in order to keep the same number of workers employed, as the division of labor increases, that means that you have to have an even bigger amount of money and materials beforehand. The capitalist who employs labor wants to create better products so they buy better machinery and try to make their workers more productive. So industry is always increasing the quantity of works, hence overproduction. Lastly, quotes Schultz, in order to increase the profits, 
the big capitalists will move to own their own estates and combination of other businesses. For example, the mine owners in Birmingham took over the entire process of iron production, which previously was distributed among many other businesses. This way, the capitalists increases their savings on raw materials in other areas of the process, like rent, for example. But of course, this only helps to divide the capitalists from the workers even more. Lastly, landlords profit off poverty. Rent has an inverse reaction to industry's wealth. When there is wealth in industry, rent is low, and when the industry experiences poverty, rent is high. The accumulation of capital increases and the competition between capitals decreases only when the wealth resides in one hand. And also when capital can, based on its size, combine branches of production. Indifference towards man results in both net and gross revenue. And that's it for Mark's Profit of Capital. Let me know in the comment section your thoughts about this whole reading. Once again, the most fascinating thing for me is that every step along the way, all of this analysis of capitalism just serves to prove that capitalism itself only wants to serve the very rich. Even people that are rich will lose while attempting to become richer through this process of capitalism. So it's not even just the working class that loses in capitalism, it's also the people that are just not rich enough to basically figure out how to maneuver themselves into a monopoly. Thank you so much for watching. If you still are, subscribe if you'd like to continue talking about world domination. I'll see you in the next one.